THE HAPPY HUNTER AND THE SKILLFUL FISHER Long, long ago, Japan was governed by Hohodemi, the fourth Mikoto, or Augustness, in descent from the illustrious Amaterasu, the sun goddess. He was not only as handsome as his ancestress was beautiful, but he was also very strong and brave, and was famous for being the greatest hunter in the land. Because of his matchless skill as a hunter, he was called Yamasachi Hiko, or the happy hunter of the mountains. His elder brother was a very skillful fisher, and, as he far surpassed all rivals in fishing, he was named Uni Sacho Hiko, or the skillful fisher of the sea. The brothers thus led happy lives, thoroughly enjoying their respective occupations, and the days passed quickly and pleasantly while each pursued his own way, the one hunting and the other fishing. One day the happy hunter came to his brother, the skillful fisher, and said, Well, my brother, I see you go to the sea every day with your fishing rod in your hand, and when you return you come laden with fish. And as for me it is my pleasure to take my bow and arrow and to hunt the wild animals up the mountains and down in the valleys. For a long time we have each followed our favorite occupation, so that now we must both be tired you of your fishing, and I of my hunting. Would it not be wise for us to make a change? Will you try hunting in the mountains, and I will go and fish in the sea? The skillful fisher listened in silence to his brother, and for a moment was thoughtful, but at last he answered, Oh, yes, why not? Your idea is not a bad one at all. Give me your bow and arrow, and I will set out at once for the mountains and hunt for game. So the matter was settled by this talk, and the two brothers each started out to try the other's occupation, little dreaming of all that would happen. It was very unwise of them, for the happy hunter knew nothing of fishing, and the skillful fisher, who was bad-tempered, knew as much about hunting. The happy hunter took his brother's much-prized fishing-hook and rod, and went down to the seashore and sat down on the rocks. He baited his hook and then threw it into the sea clumsily. He sat and gazed at the little float bobbing up and down in the water, and longed for a good fish to come and be caught. Every time the buoy moved a little, he pulled up his rod, but there was never a fish at the end of it, only the hook and the bait. If he had known how to fish properly, he would have been able to catch plenty of fish, but although he was the greatest hunter in the land, he could not help being the most bungling fisher. The whole day passed in this way while he sat on the rocks, holding the fishing rod and waiting in vain for his luck to turn. At last the day began to darken, and the evening came. Still he had caught not a single fish. Drawing up his line for the last time before going home, he found that he had lost his hook without even knowing when he had dropped it. He now began to feel extremely anxious for he knew that his brother would be angry at his having lost his hook, for, it being his only one, he valued it above all other things. The happy hunter now set to work to look among the rocks and on the sand for the lost hook, and while he was searching to and fro, his brother, the skillful fisher, arrived on the scene. He had failed to find any game while hunting that day, and was not only in a bad temper, but looked fearfully cross. When he saw the happy hunter searching about on the shore, he knew that something must have gone wrong, so he said at once, "'What are you doing, my brother?' The happy hunter went forward timidly, for he feared his brother's anger, and said, "'Oh, my brother, I have indeed done badly.' "'What is the matter? What have you done?' asked the elder brother impatiently. "'I have lost your precious fishing-hook.' While he was still speaking, his brother stopped him and cried out fiercely, "'Lost my hook! It is just what I expected. For this reason, when you first proposed your plan of changing over our occupations, I was really against it. But you seemed to wish it so much that I gave in and allowed you to do as you wished. The mistake of our trying unfamiliar tasks is soon seen, and you have done badly. 
I will not return you your bow and arrow till you have found my hook. Look to it that you find it and return it to me quickly. The happy hunter felt that he was to blame for all that had come to pass, and bore his brother's scornful scolding with humility and patience. He hunted everywhere for the hook most diligently, but it was nowhere to be found. He was at last obliged to give up all hope of finding it. He then went home, and in desperation broke his beloved sword into pieces, and made five hundred hooks out of it. He took these to his angry brother and offered them to him, asking his forgiveness, and begging him to accept them in the place of the one he had lost for him. It was useless. His brother would not listen to him, much less grant his request. The happy hunter then made another five hundred hooks, and again took them to his brother, beseeching him to pardon him. "'Though you make a million hooks,' said the skillful fisher, shaking his head, "'they are of no use to me. I cannot forgive you unless you bring me back my own hook.' Nothing would appease the anger of the skillful fisher, for he had a bad disposition, and had always hated his brother because of his virtues. And now, with the excuse of the lost fishing-hook, he planned to kill him and to usurp his place as ruler of Japan. The happy hunter knew all this full well, but he could say nothing, for being the younger he owed his elder brother obedience. So he returned to the seashore, and once more began to look for the missing hook. He was much cast down, for he had lost all hope of ever finding his brother's hook now. While he stood on the beach, lost in perplexity and wondering what he had best do next, an old man suddenly appeared carrying a stick in his hand. The happy hunter afterwards remembered that he did not see from whence the old man came. Neither did he know how he was there. He happened to look up and saw the old man coming towards him. "'You are Hohodemi, the Augustness, sometimes called the happy hunter, are you not?' said the old man. "'What are you doing alone in such a place?' "'Yes, I am he,' answered the unhappy young man. "'Unfortunately, while fishing, I lost my brother's precious fishing-hook. I have hunted this shore all over, but alas, I cannot find it, and I am very troubled, for my brother won't forgive me till I restore it to him. But who are you?' "'My name is Shiwozuchino Okina, and I live nearby on this shore. I am sorry to hear what misfortune has befallen you. You must indeed be anxious. But if I tell you what I think, the hook is nowhere here. It is either at the bottom of the sea or in the body of some fish who has swallowed it. And for this reason, though you spend your whole life in looking for it here, you will never find it. Then what can I do? asked the distressed man. You had better go down to Rin-gu and tell Rin-jin, the dragon king of the sea, what your trouble is, and ask him to find the hook for you. I think that would be the best way. Your idea is a splendid one, said the happy hunter, but I fear I cannot get to the sea-king's realm, for I have always heard that it is situated at the bottom of the sea. Oh, there will be no difficulty about your getting there, said the old man. I can soon make something for you to ride on through the sea. Thank you, said the happy hunter. I shall be very grateful to you if you will be so kind. The old man at once set to work, and soon made a basket and offered it to the happy hunter. He received it with joy, and taking it to the water, mounted it and prepared to start. He bade good-bye to the kind old man who had helped him so much, and told him that he would certainly reward him as soon as he had found his hook and could return to Japan without fear of his brother's anger. The old man pointed out the direction he must take, and told him how to reach the realm of Ringu, and watched him ride out to sea on the basket, which resembled a small boat. The happy hunter made all the haste he could, riding on the basket which had been given him by his friend. His queer boat seemed to go through the water of its own accord, and the distance was much shorter than he expected, for in a few hours he caught sight of the gate and the roof of the sea-king's palace, and what a large place it was, 
with its numberless sloping roofs and gables, its huge gateways and its gray stone walls. He soon landed, and leaving his basket on the beach, he walked up to the large gateway. The pillars of the gate were made of beautiful red coral, and the gate itself was adorned with glittering gems of all kinds. Large katsura trees overshadowed it. Our hero had often heard of the wonders of the sea king's palace beneath the sea, but all the stories he had ever heard fell short of the reality which he now saw for the first time. The happy hunter would have liked to enter the gate there and then, but he saw that it was fast closed, and also that there was no one about whom he could ask to open it for him, so he stopped to think what he should do. In the shade of the trees before the gate he noticed a well full of fresh spring water. Surely someone would come out to draw water from the well sometime, he thought. Then he climbed into the tree overhanging the well and seated himself to rest on one of the branches, and waited for what might happen. Ere long he saw the huge gate swing open, and two beautiful women came out. Now the Mikoto, Augustus, had always heard that Ringu was the realm of the dragon king under the sea, and had naturally supposed that the palace was inhabited by dragons and similar terrible creatures, so that when he saw these two lovely princesses, whose beauty would be rare even in the world from which he had just come, he was exceedingly surprised and wondered what it could mean. He said not a word, however, but silently gazed at them through the foliage of the trees, waiting to see what they would do. He saw that in their hands they carried golden buckets. Slowly and gracefully in their trailing garments they approached the well, standing in the shade of the katsura trees, and were about to draw water, all unknowing of the stranger who was watching them for the heavy hunter was quite hidden among the branches of the tree where he had posted himself. As the two ladies leaned over the side of the well to let down their golden buckets, which they did every day in the year, they saw reflected in the deep still water the face of a handsome youth gazing at them from amidst the branches of the tree in whose shade they stood. Never before had they seen the face of mortal man. They were frightened and drew back quickly with their golden buckets in their hands. Their curiosity, however, soon gave them courage, and they glanced timidly upwards to see the cause of the unusual reflection, and then they beheld the happy hunter sitting in the tree looking down at them with surprise and admiration. They gazed at him face to face, but their tongues were still with wonder and could not find a word to say to him. When the Mikoto saw that he was discovered, he sprang down lightly from the tree and said, I am a traveler, and as I was very thirsty I came to the well in the hopes of quenching my thirst, but I could find no bucket with which to draw the water, so I climbed into the tree much vexed and waited for some one to come. Just at that moment, while I was thirstily and impatiently waiting, you noble ladies appeared, as if in answer to my great need. Therefore I pray you of your mercy, give me some water to drink, for I am a thirsty traveler in a strange land. His dignity and graciousness overruled their timidity, and bowing in silence, they both once more approached the well, and letting down their golden buckets drew up some water, and poured it into a jeweled cup, and offered it to the stranger. He received it from them with both hands, raising it to the height of his forehead, in token of high respect and pleasure, and then drank the water quickly, for his thirst was great. When he had finished his long draught, he set the cup down on the edge of the well, and drawing his short sword, he cut off one of the strange curved jewels, Magatama, a necklace of which hung round his neck and fell over his breast. He placed the jewel in the cup, and returned it to them, and said, bowing deeply, this is a token of my thanks. The two ladies took the cup, and looking into it to see what he had put inside, for they did not yet know what it was, they gave a start of surprise, for there lay a beautiful gem at the bottom of the cup. 
No ordinary mortal would give away a jewel so freely. Will you not honor us by telling us who you are? said the elder damsel. Certainly, said the happy hunter. I am Hohodemi, the fourth Mikoto, also called in Japan the happy hunter. Are you indeed Hohotemi, the grandson of Amaterasu, the sun goddess? asked the damsel who had spoken first. I am the eldest daughter of Rinjin, the king of the sea, and my name is Princess Tayotama. And, said the younger maiden, who at last found her tongue, I am her sister, the Princess Tamayori. Are you indeed the daughters of Rinjin, the king of the sea? I cannot tell you how glad I am to meet you, said the happy hunter, and without waiting for them to reply, he went on. The other day I went fishing with my brother's hook and dropped it. How, I am sure I can't tell. As my brother prizes his fishing hook above all his other possessions, this is certainly the greatest calamity that could have befallen me. Unless I find it again, I can never hope to win my brother's forgiveness, for he is very angry at what I have done. I have searched for it many, many times, but I cannot find it. Therefore I am much troubled. While I was hunting for the hook in great distress, I met a wise old man, and he told me that the best thing I could do was to come to Ringu and to Rinjin, the dragon king of the sea, and ask him to help me. This kind old man also showed me how to come. Now you know how it is I am here and why. I want to ask Rinjin if he knows where the lost hook is. Will you be so kind as to take me to your father? And do you think he will see me? asked the happy hunter anxiously. Princess Tayotama listened to this long story and then said, Not only is it easy for you to see my father, but he will be much pleased to meet you. I am sure he will say that good fortune has befallen him, that so great and noble a man as you, the grandson of Amaterasu, should come down to the bottom of the sea. And then, turning to her younger sister, she said, do you not think so, Tamayori? Yes, indeed, answered the princess Tamayori, in her sweet voice. As you say, we can know no greater honor than to welcome the Mikoto to our home. Then I ask you to be so kind as to lead the way, said the happy hunter. Condescend to enter, Mikoto, Augustness, said both the sisters, and bowing low, they led him through the gate. The younger princess left her sister to take charge of the happy hunter, and going faster than they, she reached the sea king's palace first, and, running quickly to her father's room, she told him of all that had happened to them at the gate, and that her sister was even now bringing the augustness to him. The dragon king of the sea was much surprised at the news, for it was but seldom, perhaps only once in several hundred years, that the Sea King's palace was visited by mortals. Rin Jin at once clapped his hands, and summoned all his courtiers and the servants of the palace, and the chief fish of the sea together, and solemnly told them that the grandson of the sun goddess, Amaterasu, was coming to the palace, and that they must be very ceremonious and polite in serving the august visitor. He then ordered them all to the entrance of the palace to welcome the happy hunter. Rin Jin then dressed himself in his robes of ceremony and went out to welcome him. In a few moments the princess Tayotama and the happy hunter reached the entrance, and the sea king and his wife bowed to the ground and thanked him for the honor he did them in coming to see them. The sea king then led the happy hunter to the guest room and placing him in the uppermost seat, he bowed respectfully before him and said, I am Rin Jin, the dragon king of the sea, and this is my wife. Condescend to remember us forever. Are you indeed Rin Jin, the king of the sea, of whom I have so often heard? answered the happy hunter, saluting his host most ceremoniously. I must apologize for all the trouble I am giving you by my unexpected visit. And he bowed again and thanked the sea king. You need not thank me, 
said Rin Jin. It is I who must thank you for coming. Although the Sea Palace is a poor place, as you see, I shall be highly honored if you will make us a long visit. There was much gladness between the Sea King and the Happy Hunter, and they sat and talked for a long time. At last the Sea King clapped his hands, and then a huge retinue of fishes appeared, all robed in ceremonial garments, and bearing in their fins various trays, on which all kinds of sea delicacies were served. A great feast was now spread before the king and his royal guest. All the fishes in waiting were chosen from amongst the finest fish in the sea, so you can imagine what a wonderful array of sea creatures it was that waited upon the happy hunter that day. All in the palace tried to do their best to please him and to show him that he was a much-honored guest. During the long repast, which lasted for hours, Rin Jin commanded his daughters to play some music, and the two princesses came in and performed on the koto, the Japanese harp, and sang and danced in turns. The time passed so pleasantly that the happy hunter seemed to forget his trouble and why he had come at all to the sea king's realm, and he gave himself up to the enjoyment of this wonderful place, the land of fairy fishes. Who has ever heard of such a marvelous place? But the Mikoto soon remembered what had brought him to Ringu, and said to his host, Perhaps your daughters have told you, King Rinjin, that I have come here to try and recover my brother's fishing hook, which I lost while fishing the other day. May I ask you to be so kind as to inquire of all your subjects if any of them have seen a fishing hook lost in the sea? Certainly said the obliging sea-king. I will immediately summon them all here and ask them. As soon as he had issued his command, the octopus, the cuttlefish, the bonito, the oxtail-fish, the eel, the jellyfish, the shrimp, and the plice, and many other fishes of all kinds, came in and sat down before Rin Jin, their king, and arranged themselves and their fins in order. Then the sea-king said solemnly, Our visitor, who is sitting before you all, is the august grandson of Amaterasu. His name is Hohodemi, the fourth Augustness, and he is also called the happy hunter of the mountains. While he was fishing the other day upon the shore of Japan, some one robbed him of his brother's fishing-hook. He has come all this way down to the bottom of the sea to our kingdom, because he thought that one of you fishes may have taken the hook from him in mischievous play. If any of you have done so, you must immediately return it, or if any of you know who the thief is, you must at once tell us his name and where he is now. All the fishes were taken by surprise when they heard these words and could say nothing for some time. They sat looking at each other, and at the dragon king. At last the cuttlefish came forward and said, I think the tie, the red bream, must be the thief who has stolen the hook. Where is your proof? asked the king. Since yesterday evening the tie has not been able to eat anything and he seems to be suffering from a bad throat. For this reason I think the hook may be in his throat. You had better send for him at once. All the fish agreed to this, and said, It is certainly strange that the tie is the only fish who has not obeyed your summons. Will you send for him and inquire into the matter? Then our innocence will be proved. Yes, said the Sea King. It is strange that the tie has not come, for he ought to be the first to be here. Send for him at once. Without waiting for the king's order, the cuttlefish had already started for the tie's dwelling, and he now returned, bringing the tie with him. He led him before the king. The tie sat there looking frightened and ill. He certainly was in pain, for his usually red face was pale and his eyes were nearly closed, 
and looked but half their usual size. Answer, O Tai, cried the Sea King. Why did you not come and answer to my summons today? I have been ill since yesterday, answered the Tai. That is why I could not come. Don't say another word, cried out Rin Jin angrily. Your illness is the punishment of the gods for stealing the Mikoto's hook. It is only too true, said the Tai. The hook is still in my throat, and all my efforts to get it out have been useless. I can't eat, and I can scarcely breathe, and each moment I feel that it will choke me, and sometimes it gives me great pain. I had no intention of stealing the Mikoto's hook. I heedlessly snapped at the bait which I saw in the water, and the hook came off and stuck in my throat. So I hope you will pardon me. The cuttlefish now came forward and said to the king, What I said was right. You see the hook still sticks in the tai's throat. I hope to be able to pull it out in the pretense of the mikoto, and then we can return it to him safely. Oh, please, make haste and pull it out, cried the tai pitifully, for he felt the pains in his throat coming on again. I do so want to return the hook to the mikoto. All right, Tai-san, said his friend the cuttlefish, and then opening the Tai's mouth as wide as he could, and putting one of his feelers down the Tai's throat, he quickly and easily drew the hook out of the sufferer's large mouth. He then washed it and brought it to the king. Rin Jin took the hook from his subject, and then respectfully returned it to the happy hunter, the Mikoto, or Augustness, the fishes called him who was overjoyed at getting back his hook. He thanked Rin Jin many times, his face beaming with gratitude, and said that he owed the happy ending of his quest to the Sea King's wise authority and kindness. Rin Jin now desired to punish the Tai, but the happy hunter begged him not to do so. Since his lost hook was thus happily recovered, he did not wish to make more trouble for the poor Tai. It was indeed the Tai who had taken the hook, but he had already suffered enough for his fault, if fault it could be called. What had been done was done in heedlessness and not by intention. The happy hunter said he blamed himself. If he understood how to fish properly, he would never have lost his hook, and therefore all this trouble had been caused in the first place by his trying to do something which he did not know how to do. So he begged the Sea King to forgive his subject. Who could resist the pleading of so wise and compassionate a judge? Rin Jin forgave his subject at once at the request of his august guest. The Tai was so glad that he shook his fins for joy, and he and all the other fish went out from the pretense of their king, praising the virtues of the happy hunter. Now that the hook was found, the happy hunter had nothing to keep him in Ringu, and he was anxious to get back to his own kingdom and to make peace with his angry brother, the skillful fisher. But the sea king, who had learned to love him and would fain have kept him as a son, begged him not to go so soon, but to make the sea palace his home as long as ever he liked. While the happy hunter was still hesitating, the two lovely princesses, Tayotama, and Tamayori came, and with the sweetest of bows and voices, joined with their father in pressing him to stay, so that without seeming ungracious, he could not say them nay, and was obliged to stay on for some time. Between the sea realm and the earth there was no difference in the night of time, and the happy hunter found that three years went fleeting quickly by in this delightful land. The years pass swiftly when any one is truly happy, but though the wonders of that enchanted land seemed to be new every day, and though the sea king's kindness seemed rather to increase than to grow less with time, the happy hunter grew more and more homesick as the days passed, and he could not repress a great anxiety to know what had happened to his home and his country 
and his brother while he had been away. So at last he went to the Sea King and said, My stay with you here has been most happy, and I am grateful to you for all your kindness to me. But I govern Japan, and, delightful as this place is, I cannot absent myself forever from my country. I must also return the fishing hook to my brother, and ask his forgiveness for having deprived him of it for so long. I am indeed very sorry to part from you, but this time it cannot be helped. With your gracious permission, I will take my leave today. I hope to make you another visit some day. Please give up the idea of my staying longer now. King Rinjin was overcome with sorrow at the thought that he must lose his friend, who had made a great diversion in the palace of the sea, and his tears fell fast as he answered, We are indeed very sorry to part with you, Mikoto, for we have enjoyed your stay with us very much. You have been a noble and honored guest, and we have heartily made you welcome. I quite understand that as you govern Japan, you ought to be there and not here, and that it is vain for us to try and keep you longer with us, much as we would like to have you stay. I hope you will not forget us. Strange circumstances have brought us together, and I trust the friendship thus begun between the land and the sea will last and grow stronger than it has ever been before. When the sea-king had finished speaking, he turned to his two daughters, and bade them bring him the two tide-jewels of the sea. The two princesses bowed low, rose and glided out of the hall. In a few minutes they returned, each one carrying in her hands a flashing gem which filled the room with light. As the happy hunter looked at them, he wondered what they could be. The sea-king took them from his daughters, and said to his guest, These two valuable talismans we have inherited from our ancestors from time immemorial. We now give them to you as a parting gift in token of our great affection for you. These two gems are called the Nanjiu and the Kanjiu. The happy hunter bowed low to the ground and said, I can never thank you enough for all your kindness to me, and will you add one more favor to the rest and tell me what these jewels are, and what I am to do with them? The Nanjiu, answered the Sea King, is also called the Jewel of the Flood Tide, and whoever holds it in his possession can command the sea to roll in and flood the land at any time that he wills. The Kanjiu is also called the jewel of the ebbing tide, and this gem controls the sea and the waves thereof, and will cause even a tidal wave to recede. Then Rinjin showed his friend how to use the talismans one by one, and handed them to him. The happy hunter was very glad to have these two wonderful gems, the jewel of the flood tide and the jewel of the ebbing tide, to take back with him, for he felt that they would preserve him in case of danger from enemies at any time. After thanking his host again and again, he prepared to depart. The sea-king and the two princesses, Tayotama and Tamayori, and all the inmates of the palace came out to say good-bye, and before the sound of the last farewell had died away, the happy hunter passed out from under the gateway, past the well of happy memory, standing in the shade of the great Katsura trees on his way to the beach. Here he found, instead of the queer basket on which he had come to the realm of Ringu, a large crocodile waited for him. Never had he seen such a huge creature. It measured eight fathoms in length, from the tip of its tail to the end of its long mouth. The Sea King had ordered the monster to carry the happy hunter back to Japan, like the wonderful basket which Siro Zuchino Okina had made. It could travel faster than any steamboat, and in this strange way, riding on the back of a crocodile, 
the happy hunter returned to his own land. As soon as the crocodile landed him, the happy hunter hastened to tell the skillful fisher of his safe return. He then gave him back the fishing hook, which had been found in the mouth of the Tai, and which had been the cause of so much trouble between them. He earnestly begged his brother's forgiveness, telling him all that had happened to him in the Sea King's palace, and what wonderful adventures had led to the finding of the hook. Now the skillful fisher had used the lost hook as an excuse for driving his brother out of the country. When his brother had left him that day three years ago, and had not returned, he had been very glad in his evil heart, and had at once usurped his brother's place as a ruler of the land, and had become powerful and rich. Now in the midst of enjoying what did not belong to him, and hoping that his brother might never return to claim his rights, quite unexpectedly there stood the happy hunter before him. The skillful fisher feigned forgiveness, for he could make no more excuses for sending his brother away again, but in his heart he was very angry and hated his brother more and more, till at last he could no longer bear the sight of him day after day, and planned and watched for an opportunity to kill him. One day, when the happy hunter was walking in the rice fields, his brother followed him with a dagger. The happy hunter knew that his brother was following him to kill him, and he felt that now, in this hour of great danger, was the time to use the jewels of the flow and ebb of the tide, and prove whether what the sea king had told him was true or not. So he took out the jewel of the flood tide from the bosom of his dress, and raised it to his forehead. Instantly over the fields and over the farms the sea came rolling in, wave upon wave, till it reached the spot where his brother was standing. The skillful fisher stood amazed and terrified to see what was happening. In another minute he was struggling in the water, and calling on his brother to save him from drowning. The happy hunter had a kind heart, and could not bear the sight of his brother's distress. He had once put back the jewel of the flood tide, and took out the jewel of the ebb tide. No sooner did he hold it up as high as his forehead, than the sea ran back and back, and ere long the tossing, rolling floods had vanished, and the farms and fields and dry land appeared as before. The skillful fisher was very frightened at the peril of death in which he had stood, and was greatly impressed by the wonderful things he had seen his brother do. He learned now that he was making a fatal mistake to set himself against his brother, younger than he thought he was, for he now had become so powerful that the sea would flow in and the tide ebb at his word of command. So he humbled himself before the happy hunter, and asked him to forgive him all the wrong he had done him. The skillful fisher promised to restore his brother to his rights, and also swore that though the happy hunter was the younger brother, and owed him allegiance by right of birth, that he, the skilful fisher, would exalt him as his superior and bow before him as lord of all Japan. Then the happy hunter said that he would forgive his brother if he would throw into the receding tide all his evil ways. The skilful fisher promised, and there was peace between the two brothers. From this time he kept his word and became a good man and a kind brother. The happy hunter now ruled his kingdom without being disturbed by family strife, and there was peace in Japan for a long, long time. Above all the treasures in his house, he prized the wonderful jewels of the flow and ebb of the tide, which had been given him by Rinjin, the dragon king of the sea. This is the congratulatory ending of the happy hunter and the skillful fisher.